So this week, actually not this week, last week, we uh, had a full day in our family. And, you know, we ate a little bit here and there. We snack a lot at our house. It's, and, and right at the end of the night, we were just feeling, you know, you know the, that feeling you get you're not satisfied? But, you know, you, you, you had a full day, but you need something sweet. Because the day was too bland, in a way, where you had all these kind of things. So uh, my wife and I, and Nathan, we went to get some, yeah, <laughs> we went to get some waffles and ice cream, and we already had dinner, but I had another dinner, <laughs> Monte Cristo, you know, because I wanted something sweet, and we went there, and we were eating uh, waffles and ice cream, strawberries and vanilla ice cream all together, and we were sharing a, a, a moment where the whole day it was, you know, just bland, but when we were eating this ice cream, we were so happy. I saw Nathan's face, he's like, wow, this is a great time, right, family? And, you know, my wife, I mean, she's pregnant, she was happy. <laughs> I mean, she can eat ice cream any moment. Uh, and so we were there and, and doing this. And, you know, sometimes in life, you go through the grind. You go through the busyness of packing everything in your schedule that life becomes such a hassle and it becomes, you know, dry. And I think in the same way, in, in faith, in life of faith can actually become like that as well. It could become very obligatory and obligation-based. And it could become a grind, and you try to make this, and you try to make that, and you try to fit God in your schedule, but you just get it in there. But there's nothing sweet in it. I think when you read the New Testament and when you read the Bible, the Bible makes it very clear over and over again. It says that, taste the Lord. Tell someone, taste the Lord. And you're like, how do you do that? Well, it's figurative, people. <laughs> the Bible says, taste the Lord, for He is good. The psalmists say that. Taste the Lord, for He is good. That is an existential invitation, meaning God is supposed to be experience in the deepest part of our life. But a lot of times, faith becomes theoretical and an intellectual, and it, it happens on a cognitive plane, and sometimes it becomes just a thing I do. Jesus says, the most powerful statement in the New Testament, Jesus says, deny yourself. Well, that's powerful. Take up the cross. You don't like that part? <laughs> deny yourself and take up the cross, and then follow me. And people go, man, that's why Christianity is hard. You got to take up your cross. You got to obey. You got to not sin. Oh, all right. I'm trying that. It's really tough. And Jesus is like, dude, you're missing the point. Listen to the end part of the statement. You get me. And why are you being like, oh, man, it's such a drag? Jesus says, you get me. You deny everything. I mean, can you imagine in a relationship you say that? When you say, I do, oh, I get you. I, you know, I sacrifice everything to death do his part, even when we're poor, but I get you. Great. I mean, that's offensive. But a lot of people live the gospel out this way. We have to take a step back and look at what we get in this deal, what this is all about. And Jesus says twice, you get me. You're denying things so you could feast on me. Psalmist says, taste the Lord for he is good. The Bible says it's the kindness of God, the goodness of God, that leads us to change our mind and how we live our life. The word repentance is to change your mind, one's mind. And a lot of times how God actually, if you see how Jesus operates in the Bible, he does something that's actually pretty sweet. And I think we can learn Two real good lessons from, like I say, the sweetest barbecue in history. Okay? So let's look at John 6 and see how we could bring back sweetness into our life 
and how God can bring that. Take a step back to that. So Jesus here says, Jesus looked up and saw the great crowd coming. And you know, you, you probably heard the feeding of the 5,000, which is really the feeding of 20,000 because they only count men in uh, ancient times. But when you count children and women, and you know how much those people eat, um, all together, you, you're talking about 20,000 people. M men were probably only 25%. So there's 20,000 people at this crowd, and they're listening to Jesus' teaching. And they're intrigued by him, and they're moved by him. And this is an insider's conversation with Jesus and his disciples. And Jesus looked up and, and saw the great crowd coming toward him, and he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to what? To test him. For he had already had in mind what, was he, what he's going to do. And Philip answered, of course, it's logical for all of us when someone asks. And Philip says, it would take more than like a half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each, person, each one to have a bite. Bread must have been pretty cheap for 20,000 people back then. Because... Feeding 20,000 people would cost half a year's wage. And Philip is thinking logically. And Jesus says, another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter, brother, spoke up. And then he goes, well, there's a boy here with two, with two fish, small fish, and five loaves of bread. And, and Andrew, of course, is saying, I'm not giving up my lunch for these people. But there's a little boy that comes. When you read this passage and you read, actually, this story is in four different Gospels. And every single time, all the disciples are like freaking out. And really why they're freaking out is because of one reason. They're like, this is not necessary. Why do we got to feed people? We just did ministry for the whole day, praying for people. These people stink. They, they're we're praying for the sick Poor, I mean, we're doing a lot of work here. Can we send them off to some remote village? We're a remote place. Send them off to the nearby village. Let them get something to eat and come back. And Jesus says, no, you feed them. And so the first thing you have to catch in this passage is that this barbecue or crazy miracle of feeding the 5,000 was totally unnecessary. You go, wait a minute. God does things that are unnecessary? Like, like, for example, should I pray for a certain bag I like? Will he grant that request? And I know that a lot of times we come from the other side of, of making the gospel or even making faith very spiritual. And there's a, a, a you know, we, we turn it into, there's a duality. We go, well, things, some things are spiritual and some things are secular. And we divide the two, but here you see Jesus make them one. For Jesus, there is no duality of life and faith. They're one of the same. Is this spiritual? They're like the disciples are like Jesus, this is not spiritual. This is totally luxury. Right? How I mean, it's not necessary. People don't need this. You know, if you know anything about love. And getting someone to love you romantically. People listen. You can't get someone to love you by doing necessary things. Well, I was supposed to call you, so I call. I was supposed to take you out. Why'd you give me? I was supposed to. It's Valentine's Day. No. The key to someone's heart is an unexpected gift. What? And an unexpected time. If you keep doing something that's necessary, oh, I have to do this, you're never going to win anyone's heart. No, it's unnecessary, the luxury. You see here in this passage a painting, a very good picture of the disciples being knuckleheads, being spiritual, pious people that are thinking life is, is, is spiritual and the other side is secular, but God here makes it one and the same. He's very cool, very generous. He understands and my wife talked about it during worship today. He, he cares about those little things. He cares about those little things in life that, you know, may, only you 
desire in your heart, and, and, and they have nothing to do with something cool. Like, for example, how do I win the battle I have with my son at the dinner table? How do I get him to eat vegetables? Because he keeps complaining, right? It doesn't taste good, especially broccoli. So we have a deal. When we order Chinese Empire Szechuan Chinese food, and he always wants just the sesame chicken. Why do I have to eat the broccoli? It tastes bad. Because I want you to look good for the rest of your life. <laughs> I want you to poop well for the rest of your life. You know, I want you to be healthy for the rest of your life. Because I love you. So eat that broccoli. No, I don't want to. It, you know, I, I, I just don't want to. See, so, so how do you get someone to do something that's good for them, but they don't get it because it doesn't taste good? So here you see Jesus' strategy. Jesus knows how to meet the needs of people, and Jesus knows where people are at. He doesn't go straight. He doesn't do, you know, okay, I, I taught you guys, I fed you spiritually, so I'm going to stop. No, Jesus goes deeper because he knows something about humanity. Something deep I learned up through the behavior of my son. I go, okay, Nathan, you know what? For every sesame chicken I give you, you have to take a bite of the crown of the broccoli. He goes, all right, deal. But if you don't eat a bite of a crown of the broccoli, you cannot eat another chicken. Because what? The chicken is sweet. The broccoli is bitter. And this deal works every time. He eats something sweet, right? And then he eats the broccoli. What is the lesson here? What is the point that Jesus is trying to teach in this passage? First, the point of this story is simple. From the greatest lesson, the greatest and sweetest barbecue in history. Read this with me, what? The way is always what? If you believe the same men. That's why everyone should learn how to cook. This is a, a simple lesson to say. In other words, generosity trumps efficiency all the time. This is about Jesus, about God, who God is. God is generous, people. He knows your heart. He knows the part of you that's superficial, that needs some pizza once in a while. For me, Boston cream. He knows. I mean, seriously, if and you have to catch about who, what how, you know what this shows about who God is more than what God is for or what God is against. It shows more about the personality of God. I mean, why does God create five senses? Why does God not just give us you know just do an assembly line and pack you know pack food like astronaut food and, and call it carbohydrates? Protein and fat. Why not? Because all you need, food is really supposed to just keep you alive. Why, why do they have to be good? Why does God care about that? Well, because of the analogy to who God, what God is like. So you come to this passage, God knows that we're human beings. And this is why we're having uh, you know, a day in the sun next week. Sometimes you know, you need to have church outside. Because Jesus had church outside the whole time. That's why he could do this miracle. And I'm going to pray that he might do this miracle. Right? I mean, seriously, Jesus didn't have to do this miracle. Jesus didn't have to give this type of access or luxury to people. But he did. And he did it because he knows where people are at. And he knows that an unnecessary luxury ultimately gets the message across. This person really cares for me. Not just about truth, but they care about me. And let me just let you know right now that God, whatever need you might have in your life right now, I don't know what they are. You're, you're sending prayer requests. You're, you're doing this. There's conflicts in your life. I want you to know right now, whatever you need, God already knows. And he wants to provide. He wants to do miracles in our life. But sometimes we get the wrong idea about God. 
So God knows people that were human. I mean, the closest people I have in my life are people who, sh- who share food with me. If you, don't food share, if you don't share your food with me, I'm f- forget you. I know what kind of person you are. When someone goes, huh, I'm like, this person is in danger of their life. <laughs> so petty, so stingy. But if you give me your food like that, I'm like, oh, this, I, we could build a relationship. Me eating your food. But it's true. God knows that relationship and, and the deeper part of relationship is important. And you see here, very important, Jesus understands where we're at, who we are, and where we're going. And this is why Jesus does something totally unnecessary. All right, so let's go down. Now watch this. Watch what happens when... You know that you're at a barbecue or at a party. And... Um, how many people here ever go out to eat and you have leftovers? You throw it away? Me, I was at Arrow. We, we went out for, uh, they were treating us out in uh, Vancouver. And we went to this place and they ordered like 17 pies. And there's like five pies left over. And then, and then oh, some of the leaders there said, anyone want the leftovers? And I said, why, of course. They're like, other people are like, nah, we don't want, I'm like, I want the leftovers. You know, I always take the leftovers. I mean, let me just tell you right now. A party is not a party. A feast is not a feast without leftovers. I mean, don't you hate that feeling when you're splitting something and you know there's not going to be enough? I mean, that is terrible. Right? I mean, there's one thing to, to share, like we do, uh, to share like a soda at Subway, because it's unlimited. But you go, you go somewhere, and you know, and you know, some people are cheap, or you call that synonymous with smart. But I mean, like, you know, you share something, and you know there's not going to be enough. There's not going to be leftovers. And you have to be conscious about how much you eat, and you know, you might eat too much, and the other person might go, why are you so fat? You know, I mean, and you do all this, and now you're in conflict, and so... You have this conscientious feeling there, and you know, you're not free. A party is a party. A feast is a feast when you have leftovers. So when you look at this passage, you see that Jesus didn't just make enough food for people to eat so they could go back to the retreat, so they can go back to the lesson that Jesus is teaching. Jesus took time out and said, and he looked up to the Father and said, Father, I think it's time that we show people how we party in heaven. I think we should show people the economy of God. I think we should show people that I am the, D-A, not T-H-E, D-A, definite article, God. I am the author of life. I think we should show people that in us, there is there is no lack. There is no recession in the Trinity, in God. There's no recession in heaven. Maybe in hell, maybe in the earth, but not in heaven, not in us. We're sufficient. And you see here, leftovers. Look what it says. When they had all enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather what? The pieces that are left over. That's how you know it was a party. Let nothing be wasted. See, God doesn't like things to be wasted. But yet he creates leftovers. So they gathered them and what? Filled 12. One basket for every unbelieving disciple. 12 buckets of, because it was like a gift pack from heaven <laughs> to the 12 people. You know, like when you go to Oscars, they give you a gift basket. That was, that was and to remind the disciples a very key lesson in leadership and in life. You can't win people's hearts by doing necessary things. You gotta you win it. Yeah, of course through their stomach. You win it really in the end of the day. What what love? It's genuine love. Jesus did something unnecessary because he really loved people. He cared about if they were hungry or not. I mean, who cares if you're hungry or not? Does your friends care if you're hungry? People look at you and you go, Are you hungry? No one your friends don't care if you eat or not. They want to take your food. Who cares if you eat or not? Your mom, 
my mom used to drive me crazy. Four o'clock in the morning, I would come. Not partying, like a retreat, you know. And um, I, come, I come back. 4 a.m., my mom wakes up. She goes, do you want to make you something to eat? And you're like, you have a weird relationship. Don't be jealous. Because my mom told me she wanted to make me, because I'm a good son. She wanted to make me food, all right? Sometimes I would say, no, it's okay. Some other times I would say, yeah, what we got? 4 a.m. I mean, who cares if you have something to eat or not at 4 a.m.? No, I mean, who, uh, your mom. Why? Because she really cares about you. I mean, some moms are obsessed with food. They even call you. Did you eat? I mean, aren't you glad that moms are not tax, tech savvy? Because they would be texting you the whole time. Did you eat? What did you eat? Why are you eating that? You should be eating this. I mean, that's why the Lord skipped the, I mean, skipped the generation with technology. But I, when you, I mean, some of you, when you become moms, I'm sure you'll really bother your kids. They're going to block you on their phone. But you, uh, who cares if you eat or not? Well, who, who cares? Well, Jesus cared about every single person. There were 20,000 gathered, and it wasn't necessary at all. And he made leftovers. He made a feast, enough for everyone to eat, to be satisfied. I'm sure some people were really full. And they had leftovers. Look at verse 14. This is where you get the lesson, the powerful lesson that Jesus teaches us. Verse 14. After these people saw, what? The sign Jesus performed, they began to say, surely, what? This is the prophet who is to come into the world. And I don't know why this passage got cut off. Verse 15 says, then the 20,000 people by force put Jesus, they try to take Jesus, put him up, you know, like, like when you win the NBA championship or World Series, put him up, you know, carrying him and to make him king by force. That's what it says, 15. The way to the heart, what? To the stomach. These people ate this meal. I mean, seriously, when you eat a good meal, you're really grateful. This pe these people, all that Jesus did was do something totally unnecessary to their heart's content with two fish and that, and that bread. And it did something to these people. It made them know that God loves them that Jesus really cares about them, that he would do a miracle, right? Because a miracle is what? Something unnecessary. You're not living by the physics, the law of physics. You're actually doing something that's totally unnecessary. If you listen to the greatest warriors in history, I mean, you guys always hear about the Napoleon complex. How many people know about that? Anyone know what has a Napoleon complex? Any people? Right, like right around this room? I mean, I mean not to mention, I mean, it doesn't matter if you're tall or short. I mean, God accepts all. Tom Cruise is actually pretty short, you know, really short, you know. And, um, uh, and um, so uh, Napoleon, supposedly people go, well, you see why Napoleon was such a great general and, and a great strategist, and people study him all the time. Uh, he goes, because he was so short, he was overcompensating. He had, to, he had to conquer the world, the free world, because he had to prove to everybody that for every lack of height he had compared to the average man, he had more ego and more capacity. When the truth is, the secret of Napoleon's value and why he was such a great general was not because of his height, like a lot of people think. If you study deeper, Napoleon actually had an, almost a photographic memory. And what he had that really added value to his army was that he actually remembered the name of every soldier in his army. He would never forget a name to a face. So it didn't matter if you were a general or a captain. It didn't matter if you were the water boy. He would meet the water boy, shake his hand, and say, Tom, you are the best water boy in this army. And, and the water boy would be like, man, the general cares for me. The general knows me. I'm important. I'm valuable. One time, there, there was a legend says that there was a battle on a hill right near a cliff. 
And the soldiers came out, and Napoleon only had 100 soldiers. The other opposite side had 1,000 soldiers. Who would win, logically? Okay, don't answer that. It's rhetorical. And, uh, and Napoleon said, I, I'm going to give you a chance. He comes out, this little short guy. He goes, you should surrender. The other side comes out and says, are you crazy? We have 900 more soldiers than you do. And Napoleon said, okay, you, you really want to do this? I'm giving you a chance to survive. He tells 10 soldiers on the front line, calls them by name, tells them to throw themselves off the cliff. 10 soldiers, without hesitation, throw themselves off a cliff. They die. 1,000 soldiers surrender right away. You're like, why? Well, because Napoleon had 100% control of his army because they were loyal to him. Now, this is... Okay, this is not something you should do, <laughs> but it's to prove a point. How are people one? How are, how are hearts one? They're not one by doing necessary things. It's going that extra mile. How are people one by God? And God knows this, and, and Jesus knows this. I mean, the, the gospel is what? Good news because Jesus died on the cross. That was not necessary. But that's how he wins hearts. Why are we doing a, a day in the sun? It's totally not necessary. Why can't we just worship here? Because it gives a place for people to actually meet God and hear about God at a neutral setting in nature where God could speak to them in a free environment. And that's why we're doing that. Because God does things that are unnecessary to win people's hearts. So, that's what we learn from the greatest barbecue in history. That God really cares for people. That God loves people. And I pray that we learn those lessons and translate them into our life. So wherever you might be, far, close, in between, I want to let you know that God knows your heart. And I want to pray that God speaks to you today. So let's stand and pray together. So, lesson You learn from the greatest barbecue in history is you win the battle of the heart, battle of behavior, when you win the battle of the heart. So today, I want to pray that God wins our hearts. And that when we go to the day in the suns this summer, that God would win people's hearts. Lift your hands with me and let's pray right now for God to be revealed and for, for his love to be revealed to people. So Father, I want to come before you today, God. I want to thank you so much for creating us to be people that are free. You know us so well. You know all the things that we need, even the little superficial things that we need, like waffles and ice cream. Totally unnecessary. I mean, you can go with the waffle, but when you put the ice cream on it, that's just access, luxury. And it's not really good for you either. But it's a good picture of what we need in life sometimes. Now, if you ate that every day, that wouldn't be good. But God, you know that in the grind, you know in the trenches that we need those little things that are unnecessary to convey to the human heart that you love us, that you care for us, that you are watching our life, that you are leading our life. And I want to tell you right now, for whatever you might be going through in your life today, whatever lack you might have, whatever struggles you might be going through on your own, let me tell you, God sees them. Right now, come before God. Give him all, all of your needs, of your heart, where you are. Because today, God's going to not be like, okay, here's the sin in your life I want you to remove in your life. I want you to send that confession email right now. <laughs> well, what God's doing today is, okay, let me show you 
If you've forgotten why I died on the cross, which was unnecessary, it's because of grace and love for you. Today, as you come before God, be reminded that he knows all that you need. You know, the Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and, and everything shall be added unto you. And then it says, Jesus says, for God knows you need them. So God knows you need the little things. Let's go to the Father today for a God that loves us and knows us and return to him from our heart. before God today. I'm going to share with you what I prayed for when I was 16. And that, this is not a holy prayer. So, And I'm not preaching health and wealth gospel, so don't, don't follow me. I'm just giving you an example of how God cares for us with things that are totally unnecessary. So when I was 16, I said, God, I think I really want an Infinity I-30. Now, of course, okay, I'm just, you know, fair warning here. This is how God worked in my life. So don't think of all the cars you want right now. But as an example, but at 21, I did receive an Infinity I-30. And you're like, well, you're just a spoiled brat, that's why. But, I mean, in reality, I remember getting this car. And when, as soon as I got in the car, and you might call this, you know, whatever, but God whispered to me, and this is what he said, I'm going to take care of your life. And you know, I didn't see the movie yet. Infinity and beyond. So when I saw Toy Story, I was like, wow, that's what God said. But... I wanted, I wanted to just let you know, okay? That is totally unnecessary. But you know what? It showed me that God listens to every prayer. God is so in tune with our heart. And let me just say, sometimes He's going to say no. But there are times where he does things that are unnecessary to win the heart. And for me, it wasn't about the car, and it's about all the things that I got in my life and all the things that came forward. It really showed me that God cares for me. I 
want to let you know today that every single person on this planet God is listening to. God the Father is listening to. He's listening to you. So if you're right now freaking out about finances, freaking about your future without, you know, well, how am I going to provide for my children? And you don't even have a boyfriend and, uh, or a girlfriend, you know. Go, oh, uh, look at the economy, you know. This is just terrible. How am I going to pay off these loans? And, uh, you know, you know, we worry about things we don't need to worry about. And right now, I want you to come before the Father and say, Father, show me that you got all this in my life. Father, we thank you for carrying us first this way and winning our hearts. Help us to win others by letting them see you in us. Bless this, bless all the days in the sun. Let people come and hear and meet you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Be seated. So, got some announcements for you from AMC. Okay, you know about the a prayer, five three nine seven prayer. Uh, we're we're praying for this, and, and my wife prayed for it in the morning, in worship. You can always send prayer texts there. So do so, and we believe God is answering prayers already, and He's working. Okay, you can write that down. All right, go down. That's our first announcement. Uh, next week would be Day in the Sun. Please pray for this. Led, uh, last time we had a real great time, and a lot of people coming out. Uh, it's a great time for family and friends to just come out, hang out, eat some food, and chill out with us. And maybe Jesus will do a miracle. So I'm, I'm thinking pizza. So I don't know. We'll see. But uh, it's going to be a great time. Uh, you'll get have all the information in your email, okay? Next. Uh, offering, you can give today, and we know this, at a, you can give to QuickPay if you have Chase at offering at oneofthechurch.tv or at PayPal at our website, or you can just give outside. Uh, next. Small groups meet weekly. Uh, continue to pray for them, and you know where they meet, okay? Uh, lastly, I believe we have the baptism t-shirts, we don't have them. Ooh, hump. You guys are in trouble right now. Um, <laughs> but uh, what we're doing is we're, gonna, we're, we're thinking about how to do baptism. Um, obviously, Central Park, Central Park doesn't allow us to dunk people in the pond or the lake. Um, and um, we're going to get a portable baptistry, but uh, they don't allow anything on the park. So we're thinking of different ways to do this. Um, but, so we're going to push back all baptisms uh, for both campuses to August 19th. But we're going to take pre-orders for t-shirts. Um, and we'll show you next week. Oh, okay. All right, I forgive you. <laughs> so this is American Apparel t-shirt. And what we're going to do is create, for every class, a baptism t-shirt with the water drop there. So this is American Apparel. And, and so everyone getting baptized, we're going to say, hey, uh, this color and this shirt. We uh, suggest that you donate $20 for the t-shirt so we don't lose money on it, you know, uh, okay? But it's donate, okay? Now, if you're really broke, if you're really broke, broke, we'll put you on an installment plan for two years. No, I don't know. But you, you, know, you know what I mean. But, uh, you know, so we're going to do this, and we're going to do this for every class. If you were baptized in 2009 or whatever, or 10, uh, you, can, you can pre-order those, and you can give 
um, when you order that, you know, funds to your small group leader. And it'll, it'll be um, fun. And we're going to make those. So that's going to that's gonna be very interesting. And so a lot of people will be wearing the baptism shirts on Sunday. That will be fun to watch in August as people get probably sprinkled. So some of you are really lucky instead of us dunking you. It's pretty fun dunking people. Um, so let's pray for these. Father, I want to thank you for... Uh, For loving us so much and um, understanding where we come from and where we're at and you meet us there. And that's the most powerful thing about the gospel. You don't ask us to come to where you're at, but you meet us where we're at and you win us. And your glory really is that you win our hearts. And then our hearts change and we follow you and make you king of our life. And we ask that would happen in 180. God, we give you all these announcements to you, and we ask that you bless it, Father, that your hands bless it, that you would anoint it, and that you would bring glory to you. We thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, God bless you. We'll see you at the park next week. Lord, it was you. Sure.